Katnaba Natani, and I am from the Navajo Nation. I live in the Four Corners area out in New Mexico. I traveled out here on Thursday, um, Thursday morning, and to participate here. Um, my clans, when out in Navajo country, were raised um, as traditional people when we leave our home and when we're introducing ourselves to always acknowledge our grandparents, our clans, our, our um, it, it's an identity of who we are as, as Diné Navajo people. So my clan is Hoathane, which means mini Hogan clan. And I am born for Maideshkizhni, which means Hamas clan or Coyote Pass clan. My maternal grandparents are the Mexican clan, Nake Dene'e Deshiche, and my paternal grandparents are the Steep Rock clan, which is Senahapilti'e um, Deshinele. So the proper way for me to introduce myself is with the clans, Hawathane and Shle. Um, so that that um, introduce introducing of clans is very um, important in Navajo country and among our people because it first establishes our our kinship to one another. Um, a lot of times we'll have our, maybe our grandmothers, our little sisters, our grandfathers, grandmothers out in the audience. So the, and, and that determines how we, how we interact with each other. And it's a beautiful way of, of um, the kinship that was established for our people by our holy deities. Our, our, when, we, when our people were, were created, there was many different um, acknowledgements, many different um, philosophies, even a way of life, um, how they, they, that was our instruction as Dene people to use, to, to live in a holistic way while we're here on Mother Earth. And so, and one of our, our beautiful philosophy is we, um, we want to achieve to walk in beauty. So in many of our prayers, we always acknowledge and, and say, Hajon na shado. Dishche wajonga na shado. Today, I walk, I, I want to walk in beauty and that just that phrase encompasses other philosophies of um, of leadership, of teaching, of um, acknowledgement of our surroundings. So just that one philosophy. There's many many teachings from it, and I'm I'm very honored that my parents they they taught me. Um, some of our traditional ways, and I was brought up with traditional upbringing. And um, today, um, as I mentioned, I live out in the Four Corners area, and I'm a rancher. I, I am a full-time weaver. I've been weaving professionally now for about close to 22 years. And I also have sheep that I um, take after. And about 22 years ago, my parents handed over that responsibility to me. And so I am the one who makes the decisions for our sheep of when they're going to be sheared in the springtime, when we're going to go to the mountains to where there's um, a different type of forage for our sheep. Um, sometimes our people have ceremonies at home where we're honoring the transition of a young girl into womanhood, or maybe there is a relative or someone who is needing treatment, needing to be, um, to return back to 
uh, living a holistic way of life. Maybe there's a veteran that has gone to the war in the military, or not necessarily the war, but a veteran, um, maybe they saw something very um, horrific that, in, in that, that disturbs their mental thinking. So there are ceremonies that we have to help that, that veteran restore back to harmony. And at the time, there's traditional foods that are needed to be fed to the people. So often people are asking for help in that way. So I also am responsible for, um, you know, donating our sheep to help families to return back um, to harmony in, with the different ceremonies. So um, now um, I learned how to weave when I was seven years old. I came home from school and my mother um, said, today you're gonna learn how to weave. And that's how I started weaving as a young child. And around that time also, I was visiting my paternal grand grandmother. Um, this is my dad's mom. I was visiting her and she was carding wool. She was carding this beautiful uh, brown wool that you see in this uh, shawl here. And this is the outer coat. So she was carding that wool when I started getting into her project. And my, my mom and my dad told me to not bother her, her, her carding project, but she told them, let her touch the wool, let her touch the, the fiber, because I want her to be a weaver. And I'm going to give her her Navajo name also, is what she said. And she had one of her very close relatives, a close sister friend of hers even. They grew up together and her, her name was Tkhetnaba. So my paternal grandmother said, I'm going to name her after my cousin who, um, who I want to remember. So she said, my granddaughter is going to be named Tkhetnaba, but I'm going to add on to her name. She's going to be Tkhetnaba Akhlohagi, which means the weaver. In Navajo culture, um, our, our names are very descriptive of, of who we may be, our, how our livelihood is. And so my paternal grandmother, I do believe she felt in, in, her, in her mind, she was possibly afraid to, that the Navajo weaving might be dying because in her community of Tualina, she saw the tr a, a great change. She saw the transition of the um, using the horses to, to, for transportation to the wagon and to, the, to seeing the first automobile that came into the community. So I believe it was it was her wish, her um, her wish that I would I would um, become a weaver, and um, maybe about two years after that, I started do doing my Navajo weaving, and then I wove throughout high school, and in the summertime, I used to weave um, the weavings, and then I would sell the, my my weavings at Santa Fe Indian Market, while my mother demonstrated. And with that money, I used to buy my school clothes. So I often thought that I was being punished by having to weave during the summer months. And my three older brothers, they didn't have to weave and they took care of the sheep, but um, not, they used to have me take care of the sheep too, as I was the youngest out of the whole family. So my mother did a great, a great deed for me by introducing the weaving to me at a young age. And then um, 
um, having me get back into my weaving. So I wove throughout my teenage years and then I also wove when I was in high school. And then after high school, I joined the military and I joined the Navy and I was stationed on a ship. I was um, stationed on the USS Prairie. It was a destroyer tender and I got stationed out in California. And we went on a voyage, an overseas voyage, uh, about maybe a year and a half into my, my enlistment. And we, were, we went to the P South Pacific. We went to places like um, Hawaii, Guam, Alangapo, Philippines, uh, pa Patio Beach, Thailand, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Tokyo. So we, we sailed among the different islands and in the uh, Far East there. And when I was in the Philippine, the Philippine Islands, I just, it was four months into my, our voyage. And I was probably about 20 years old. And then I grew so lonely. I was just missing my home. I was so sad. And um, I went to, on a Saturday, I went out to the Baja, Baja market and I saw a, um, it's like a flea market. And I saw some, some um, women selling mats, woven mats out of um, palm leaves. And they had um, pocketbooks, handbags, hats, um, just a variety of woven goods made out of the palm leaves. And I started touching those palm leaves and I started telling the, the ladies, I'm a weaver. And I touch all of them and I said, I'm a weaver. I know about this. I know, uh, I, I know. And then I said, I'm Tkhatnapa Aklohogi. And this part is very emotional because I really believe that the holy deities, the um, spider man and spider woman visit me all the way in, in the Philippines. And they reminded me where I come from, where my roots are. So I, it, it uplifted me to see those, those woven goods. And then um, I came, we got done with our voyage. And then I, I became a civilian. I got done with my active duty. And then suddenly I wanted to weave. And I, I call home and I told my mom, I want, I need to weave, you know, and so send me all my, my, um, my tools. So being that my mother is a teacher and she has a lot of looms, I mean, small traveling looms, looms that you can take apart. You can take apart every piece. And then, so that's what she sent me is one of these looms that were about, I don't know, three feet high. So one Friday night, I, when I got my package, I assembled my loom and I started weaving again. So I was just so weaving, Navajo weaving is so powerful in that way, because as I mentioned, the holy deities, they created that weaving for us. And each part of the Navajo weaving loom is so significant. They have songs associated with them. There's representations of the environment. The warp represents our life and the Navajo loom, the tension cord is a zigzag and that represents lightning. The, the comb that beats down the weft represents um, white shell. So the whole weaving in itself is very alive, representative of the environment, representative of our lives even. So when we sit down to weave, we receive those blessings, those songs. And I believe that when you are very connected as a weaver with, with your tools and with your weaving, all you start, you know, it helps you. Um, even it helps you with your thinking. It, it just, it just massages your thinking. And if you have problems and you sit down to weave, it seems like the weaving just embraces you.
and it tells you the next step to do, the next part to do. And because of the power of the Navajo loom, I believe that's that's the reason why it's it's so um, it's so meditative the weaving process, and even the hand spinning process is meditative. So. I primarily weave utilitarian garments um, like shoulder blankets, women's shoulder blankets or men's shoulder blankets. When the Trading Post came into Navajo country, they um, created Trading Posts in different communities and had weavings um, representative of those areas. And so the chief blanket, well, it's a shoulder blanket, but you know, as time changes, um, the, the blankets also receive kind of a romantic name. And so now those shoulder blankets are known as chief blankets. And so they're, but the, what the important thing to know about those shoulder blankets is our people wove them and the common people use them, not just ch chiefs or leaders or significant people, but common people use them. And a lot of them also were used as trade items with our neighbors, like the Pueblo people, um, some of our, our neighbors, um, the Ute people, and some of the Navajo uh, shoulder blankets even made their way all the way to South Dakota and North Dakota. So those weavings were very significant and they, I do believe that they are um, responsible for um, our, you know, our survival here now because of the many uses that that we use those shoulder blankets a lot of them were used as as tarps as raincoats as um, mats to sleep on um, so that's primarily what i do is the the um, shoulder blankets and then i with my mother's um support i you know as i mentioned my mom is a a, a weaving instructor and she's she's always known that that there's weavers across the globe just as i mentioned in the philippine islands i met some weavers there and what they were weaving was those mats well my mother is very encouraging to me and tells me learn about other weavings in addition to our weaving. And this is a weaving that I'm doing a lot, which is done on a, on a triangle shape frame. And there's um, nails that, that, are, that are sticking out around that triangle shape. And this weaving is made on it. So it's the process of this type of weaving, its origination is from the Viking era. And that type, this type of weaving almost um, died out. And then it was, it was just rediscovered again. I would say maybe about, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago, maybe. So now a lot of um, people are doing this type of weaving. What's nice about this weaving is if you have one strand, one strand will will weave this whole this whole piece. I mean, of course, you gotta have about what 300 yards or something, maybe or 200 yards. But you don't have to. You start from the top. There's a sequence of this type of weaving where you start from the top and it finishes in the center. So when you oh, when whatever you weave here, you're also weaving on this side. So it, it, you finish it in the center. And so this is a type of, of weaving that I'm exploring with. And when you do that type of weaving, the, you can't really make designs. The design you, you can make is plaids, just whatever, if you use different colors, you know, squares come out. So I, I feel that I'm always challenging the loom and I, I I'm not too fond of plaids, so I don't do too many plaids. So I try to create something different. This is kind of a plaid. So you see here, this, this here is wool from my sheep that I, I have and it's hand spun. And this is the natural color. And I have added 
in my spinning, I have added some sparkly stuff. You can kind of see it sparkled and in other colors as well. So what happens with the Navajo Chiro is because its fleece is about, about 12 inches, maybe 14 inches. And here I'm putting on the um, fringes here. This is the outer coat here. So the Navajo Chiro, they look like goats. And so this is the outer coat and underneath it is the, the wool, which is here, which is this chocolate brown here. And then this is the outer coat of it. So it kind of has two, two different textures. So because the wool is so like 12 inches and after you wash the wool, you can tease it out and you can just start spinning it. You don't have to, you don't have to card it and create a perfect strand. So that's another thing that I'm, I, I'm just, I, I like to, I can spin very nicely, but I like it. I, I like to put texture in it. So I deliberately make them chunky, skinny, chunky, and then I add those two together. So it makes a heavier, heavier strand. And that's what this one, how this one is made. So um, <clears throat> this is usually how the Navajo weavings are made. They're, they have a straight edge on the top and then also a straight edge at the bottom. And usually they're symmetrical. This one is a, a weaving that my mom made and this is one of my collections. And this is what she used um, different plants to get these colors. There's a plant called matter root and that's what gives this color here. That color also is used to dye moccasins. When you see a lot of um, the Diné people out in Navajo country, you see the moccasins are terracotta color and that's where that color comes from, that matter root. And um, I believe maybe this lighter color might be um, an exhausted ground lichen. So you see lichen grown kind of, with, well, I, I'm not sure how they are grown, but you, they're, they're kind of on the ground in a pinyon juniper woodland area and they're light, light um, kind of like light green. You, you collect those and it gives a darker color, but I believe that's what this one is. And I don't really know what, where she got the, the beautiful orange. But um, if you have questions about what I'm talking about, um, please ask me and then I could dialogue with you and tell you a little more. Um, so I was telling about that triangle loom. It's, this is an, another triangle loom, but it's done on a smaller frame. My daughter made this one here, and this is like a neckerchief. It, you know, some people don't want too much wool around them. So this is what they could, you know, they could have to keep, to keep you warm still. And this one is made out of alpaca. So the fiber is really soft. This piece here is a combination of my um, sheep wool and then also wool that I purchased from the store. And this is my very, very newest piece of triangle weaving. And it's done a little bit different again, but you see how the dark brown color, they look like bubbles. It's felted here. Yeah, I, and then the, the um, fringes are the outer coat of the Navajo Chiro. And actually, this is the very first piece I made like this, and I'll be doing more like this. This one here, the way the weaving is done is not like, like how it's recommended with the triangle loom. I, I, what I did with this one here is my triangle loom is six feet wide. I loop the warp up and down like that. And then I just started weaving it. I had to weave it with my hands and it's very different from the Navajo loom. Yeah, but I'm very, I'm excited about this piece here and yeah. <clears throat> but I have, I, I have, um, right now I have uh, 16 sheep and I just, um, I haven't had the, the sheep 
breed for the past two years because it's been very difficult. You know, we're just coming out of this pandemic and the, the environment out where I live, out south of Shiprock, I live in a desert and the forage is, is almost gone. It, the land is so barren. So in order to continue having sheep, I have to buy hay for them now and feed them about a bale of hay a day. And in the evening, I give them corn. So we used, when I first took over the sheep, it, we had about 40, I think 40 sheep. And then, um, you know, over the past years, they've gone up, they go down, gone up. And they're a lot of work. It's a lot of work to, to own sheep, to care for them. And so now I'm down to 16 and um, I'm gonna try to get down to eight where it's a lot more manageable. And um, yeah, so that's that's a story about um, the, the sheep that I have. And so this here is a Navajo weaving and it's done with all hand spun again. And it's done it's a, I, I spun the wool bulky. And again, there's a lot of texture in here. So if, I don't know if you can see this clearly, but if you, if you see this here, this, this part, this um, design here, it, it pops out and it's creating a two dimensional texture. And it's, this is also doing that. And there, throughout the weaving, I, I introduced that. So my work is very, very different. You know, I do traditional type weaving and I'm, I'm exploring and I do believe in the beginning, I used to worry my mom. She thought that I, was, I wasn't weaving the, the right way, you know, the, the right way of making uh, two gray heel patterns or wide rune patterns. And, um, but, what I've discovered, my personal growth with weaving is um, the trading post was really good when they came into our country in Navajo land. They did good. They brought different foods. They brought different utensils. And they also um, created communities where designs describe that, like the two gray heels. That's a very famous um, pattern. However, um, sometimes weavers forget to, to believe that they can create what they want. And if, if I take this to the trading post, they don't want this because it's not indicative of traditional to them. But for me, there's something is happening with art everywhere and there's a transition that's happening. This is a Navajo weaving because it's made on a Navajo loom and it's made with Navajo chiro wool. <laughs> and there's other types of wool in here like silk, silk and merino, merino wool. And um, it's, it's, it's another way of weaving. And sometimes our kids are, are um, we push them away when we don't allow them to create, just to be creative and, and um, create what they want.